chair this next session and introduce the two presenters, especially because what they will do, perform live, is at the basis of what Orpheus stands for, considering music making while doing so. It also is very natural for me to introduce Alice Shu because it's partly about memoria and at my age that's a very urgent topic. I just barely remember being at the conservatory in Ghent here having classes in counterpoint and fugue and my teacher could sight read in four different claps and he didn't want to explain to me how he did that as a performer. It's magic, this was, it's magic. It's, it was very marvelous so I hope after 30 minutes of Alice Shu that I will now know how to do this. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. And thank you, Bruno, for organizing this. I'm very honored to be here today to give this talk at the Orpheus Institute. Um, so, I, um, my name is Al Shu, and I, my doctorate was in chemistry. I back in the University of Chicago. Back then, I was theorizing about the structure and ordering about liquids. And then after that, I, wanted, I went to a conservatory and got a master's in piano. And then, and then I was not convinced by the piano teachers telling me how to play Bach from the text. So then I came to the uh, historical performance and then I found myself here in the Netherlands today. So my talk today is reading from the Italian keyboard partitura in its relation to memorial. So, the score that's to your right is the subject of today's talk. It's called uh, Italian Keyboard Partitura. It's the early kind of music printing. Well, they're still in movable type. It came, came as an arrangement for keyboard players to play three, four voices at the same time rather than playing from a part of a choir book because these choir books are big and they're intended for different people to play together, sitting at a table perhaps, so the tenor is reading from here and the uh, bass player reading like that and then the alto reading like this, so it's not so possible for one person to read like that. Therefore, we have the um, early version of of note notation that's developed for notating counterpoint uh, for keyboard players. And it's used about for 100 years of time, from 1575 to 1685. And at the same time, there's also the entablatura, which is basically arranged for the two hands. So we have two steps, one hand, one step. Both hands are happy, but and which we know that this two staff notation is what to develop later into our modern notation system. And this is just a bit of background information. So there are a lot, this is just a lot of sources of all the uh, of the collections that were published in this so-called open score format. And and as you can see, most of them are of four voices, otherwise it wouldn't make sense to have four parts. And in the um, more complicated contrapuntal style or imitative style, so you see Ricari's, Gonzonas, and Fantasias, and it was used in Italy, and then Fulberger was Catholic German, and etc. So what do people say back then? Well, I mean, the two-stage notation already existed. But on the other hand, um, the keyboard partitura, this open score for line notation, was still being used up until quite late, 1685. Um, so what do people say? Uh, Bernardo Strozzi apparently said, well, to be sure, the score of all the parts was invented in an earlier time. And one was supposed to be able to play from it as accurately as written, which is actually even full now. But because it's so difficult, it's, it's laborsome and worrisome, and because those people who invented it and taught it are not dead, or at the very least quite old, which is <laughs> how I felt since last summer I started practicing from um, this uh, party 
Ventura. I think by 16, 19, I would have been either really old or dead already. And whoever thinks this is necessary should spare himself the trouble. So why not just get the bear rider? All the notes were there. Be happy. But it seemed interesting. And um, so we have quotes from Prascavalli. He did have in his resource the most magnificent. Uh, to publish his toccatas in the most lavish engravings in the two staff notation. However, he decided to publish four of his works, the Capricci's, uh, Fiori di Cali, and then the Canzones, which carries in this Italian um, partitura format. And what he, he said, he said, to those who study this work, since for certain players, the performance of these pieces might be very difficult, either on account of their various tempi variations, which we know about this music, or because many players have abandoned the practice of performing from score. From score means from the keyboard partitura. So we know that by the turn of 17th century, the performers don't really want to do anymore. It's too much effort. And, and, and then he says also, um, this I consider of great importance, for players to, to practice playing from score, not only because I commend it to those who wish to engage themselves ex ex exclusively in such composition, but also it is necessary. He said it was necessary since it was, as, um, it distinguishes and makes known for the true goal of virtuosic actions from the actions of the ignorant. So he said it was important. So why, I mean, why don't you just put all the four, four voices into two hands? It's much easier to read. I don't know, but it seemed interesting. So, so I just tried. In, after all, I mean, com conductors and read scores of multiple lines, and it is not. Uh, improbable that one could play from a uh, four stacks, but the problem also is, well, the the these clubs, um, they're not standardized. Well, there are different names, but I think there are only three kinds of clubs. There's G clap up here, but it could be on this line, which is what we have nowadays, or down the first line. And then there's the F clap, which right now in the score is on the third line, or it could be also on the second line. That's in modern school. And the C class, they move around. Basically, it's just convenient where the voices depends on the voice, range of the voice. So we don't have any extra lecture volumes. So, so I'm just gonna show. So what is I didn't start from the name of this piece. This is from Capricci, Fresco Valdi's Capricci written Fasola. So well, what did I learn as a kid to learn to play counterpoint? Well, you start from playing one voice at a time. So, well, the first line is easy because that's just a, uh, a G clap. So it's, and I know the P is written fast a So in that first line on top in the yellow, it's just so funny. Okay. And then vice versa. And then I pick the easy ones to start with. The third line is the chromatic version of Remy Fasola. Okay, now what happens in the second line? Okay, start from E. Um, okay, at the bottom, so that's an A, a C. Well, it's not, it takes a little time, but not improbable, so far as one reads intervalically. Now, the problem is with alignment, because with this movable, movable pipe, the voices were not lined up. I mean, they were only lined up at the bar lines, what the bar lines are for. So for example, this top voice, that's uh, in the modern notation, it's called half note. Clearly, it does not, the note value doesn't equal to to eighth notes. So if you're trying to align visually, learn it like you learn from the modern score. Uh, uh, it's just a lost game. So it really is. You just 
trying to line things up uh, on these smallest null values just doesn't, it's, it's, it's very inefficient. So, what works is, well, we just align things at the bar line and at the pulse level instead of trying to line up every little note line. For example, well, I could start from the easy voices, the top and the, the third line. So because I know it's in four, so it's. So I'm, instead of thinking, well, is that C sharp coming after the E? No, I'm thinking of it's a pickup to the next bar where side. I'm thinking of where they line up. Now you may say, okay, now let's look at things that are more complicated. Uh, the top two voice. So instead of trying to figure out uh, which note actually lines up, I start from breathing. It's so that's where they line up. I don't really care about the small notes. And then it's and then at the bottom voice, um, so I know it's a pickup to the next bar line. So So on and so forth. So basically, I line up at the pulse level, but of course, there are always, sometimes you go back to fix the small things like, okay, this, this quarter note or eighth note line or whatever, how does that work? Yeah, but that's at the lower level. So, and then the next thing is sort of how you divide the hands once you have more voices, which is actually the standard process of learning counterpoint at the keyboard, anyways. Now, the difficult things is when you have constant voice crossing, then, then this doesn't work so well because then, in the, then you have um, one voice crosses the next, it's, 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 it's um, you have to kind of, well, but then voice crossing are difficult to deal with anyways even if they use a two-stage notation system. And it works well when the voices are intuitive because <coughs> such as the second and fourth voice, I know the bottom voice, I don't have to read every single note, well, I have to check, but I know it's just that voice flip around. Okay, so it, that's how I got it to work. And, But because of this process that's needed for lining up all the voices, and during this process, I cannot be relying on visual cues because they're visually not lined up, unless I'm borrowing. I do have to memorize each voice by heart, maybe just one measure or two measures. Or in this case, I think four measures when I get and because that's, that's when I can actually process the line up process. Okay, oh, that's the TV. That's not my iPad. Mm -hmm. Where does it say? Okay, just the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, then I thought, well, and people say, well, you're just learning it by heart. But when I ask myself, could I draw a relation between, we're talking about memory, because I have to memorize in small chunks and play from score, which is the computer application. And I remembered studying the classical rhetoric. We do have memoria as one of the five canons. And these are the explanations. They sound um, 
the translation is based on Francis Smith. So in her words, her translation, memoria is the firm perception in the soul of things and words. Okay, but throughout my studies of historical performance, memoria wasn't really discussed. If you look at a textbook, often it's just one paragraph. That's it. And it's not only just regarding musicians, it's there was just wasn't much interest, especially regarding um, the relation between rhetorical memory and its relation to invention, which is the composition. And then I looked, well, th is it, are there actually writings about this? Was there none? Why didn't people, why weren't people interested? Well, but there are actually texts about it, and actually a lot. So let's just look at um, sources from the antiquity, and uh, the at um, the second one. Her excuse my Latin, I cannot pronounce it. Um, at her moon. So this is according to the theory. Uh, what's written in the classical treatises? Memory, rhetoric in the rhetorical sense doesn't only consist of natural memory, which is what we think of nowadays. We just, oh, somebody has good memory. That's great, fantastic. But there is also the artificial memory that's strengthened or confirmed by training. And, and I read all this, and really, it's established from places and images. So it reads like this, for the places are like wax tablets, or our iPads, of images like the letters, arrangement of the disposition of the images like a script. And then in these places, they should be form a series and must be remembered in their order so that we can start from any locus in the series and move backwards and forwards from it. And if these have been arranged in order, and the result of that, if we're reminded by the images, we can repeat the whole thing that's committed to these locations, places, and proceeding in their direction from any locus that we please. So when I read this, it was a bit confusing. So then I thought, well, okay, so what they're talking about, basically, locus, the places, and the, net, and the image. The places, locus, is, in computer language, you can think of it as an ordered list. And this list has to be unique and irregular and varied, avoid of symmetry, because if it's symmetrical, you would know exactly where you are on the list. And, and then there were descriptions in the treatise that, well, it's moderate interval, moderate bright. They're talking about real locations, architectures. And, and then the images, then one used to put on these specific locations, comes in two kinds. There are the images that reminds us of things, or ideas, or arguments. And then there are images that remind us of each single word. So when you're trying to, when, according to this treatise from the antiquity, the artificial memory is constructed from first a structural level. Okay, you, you memorize, you know an order of things in places, and then you put images on these places, and the images can be only reminding of us of the ideas, or that of every specific word, or every specific note. Now, in the images, it's important that they are dramatic and of exceptional beauty or ugliness, because the more memorable the images are, the more that they arouse emotion. In fact, the more we remember. Otherwise, we just like don't remember anything. So, fast forward, 
the me but in medieval ages, the oratory tradition disappeared. Well, that's what I read. It became the form is becomes in the form of preaching. You don't have this classical theater. So in a sense, the four the, the orders of record becomes devotional. And that these locations are replaced by the atom system or a cathedral. And you have you have all these um, devices to help you remember um, what what the texts are or what what the what the preaching is. So I have to fast forward a little bit because coming back to the Renaissance and I why why um, why is it it sort of fell out at some point? And it's because of the arrival of printed books, which is happened was introduced around 1450, and and that gray line is purely imagination. That's based on no facts, that is not imagination. So because in the middle in the medieval time, it was trained all so hard um, with images and learning all everything by heart through this uh, through this system. And by the time the printer books arrived, well, there's no need to remember things anymore because we could just have printed books easily. So there's one one school that says, well, we don't need this artificial memory. This is this is just um, a thing of the past because we have printed books now, and and it eliminates artificial memory and recommends only memory by heart. However, there is the other branch of Renaissance that embraced it and transformed it, and they said, oh, the mind and memory of man is divine, and powers of grasping reality through magically activated imagination. And therefore, it's with the Italian Renaissance that they returned the art of memory as part of rhetoric. So if we look at the left is uh, the score of the Italian partitura, and to the right is the the um, new German keyboard tablature, which were invented, if I'm not mistaken, around the same time, around 1570. Um, to the left, this is something you could see the lines and shapes and the order of things, while the new German keyboard tablature, it contains all specific information you have these are letters, so all the notes are written in letters, and these are um, these are note value, and so it's and they are perfectly lined up for voices vertically, for as much as we're concerned. So it's very precise way of notating. However, it is a very different kind of notation system that that. If we compare it to the Italian partitura, it does not remind us from the um, from the locations of all this theory that we read about about the theory of artificial memory. So I will briefly. There are actually too many too many treatises about the art of memory in the Renaissance, and I have to confess I cannot have not read and understand all of them. But there's one I think we could look at, and I could use it today to show you how that's relating to this piece that I'm about to play. So 
It's Giulio Camillo's memory here. What? It was a man uh, who was very popular in the 16th century, in Italy, Venice, and France. And so what he invented was a theater, or amphitheater. Basically, he used the principles of classical artificial memory, but instead of the cathedrals, he invented, he used a Roman theater. And then he created, he, he, he tweaked these architecture and made it asymmetrical of orders and frames. And then he put a lot of images, wooden images, and figures and ornaments in little boxes. And on each box, you draw a speech by Cicero. And so apparently, the design of theater is such that if I look into the theater as a sole so spectator, I look at this theater, it would magically activate all the speeches which they already remember from it, infusing them with the planetary virtue through which they would have magical effects on the hearers. So, I think, I think, yes, there could be a re relation that's strong between the rhetorical memory and playing from the Italian partitura. If I construct a memory system, not unlike what Camille did, I, I could say that all these different sections of music are just different locus or different places. And remember that these fantasias, the structures, there's nothing like a bipartita structure, no. It's, it's a unique, uh, the, every section is different. So it works perfectly as a, um, the locus, loci system to, to structure your memory. And so when performing it, or reading from a score, it's like I'm walking through an asymmetrical formulated by the composer's architecture. And the structure of music is a mnemonic device that activates the speeches, the sexual speeches that I pull out from the floor. And then on each locus, loci, or passage, there's an active image. And this image should be vivid and striking, or based on whatever planet, planet it is, it has different effects. That it's, each section is full of figures and ornaments, and it was designed to arouse emotion. So, I think it's successful. Um, that I, yes, after working through the whole piece, um, with this notation, I did have a firm perception in the soul of things and words, as what Cecil said. So, I will now play for you.
applying memory to reading a score. I'm sure this will uh, set up some questions, but we will keep those for after the second presentation, which is by uh, Jonathan. And I think we need to look at how to boost the PDFs. Yes. Classics. Um, I've always wanted to <clears throat> do more and be more creative and get through that barrier and somehow be more like the composers whose music I was playing. Uh, I remember this as a, as a young boy, you know, we were saying Bruno was talking as a pianist, I had exactly the same experience. The music came to us in schools and there was always this feeling of a conceptual kind of barrier, this wall between myself and the music. So uh, for my teachers, of course, you know, we studied the biographies, we talked about the, the, you know, the organ, you can talk about registration, you can talk about the practice of the music, but somehow this doesn't remove the barrier. It's like you still don't really know where the music came from um, <coughs> and why it's there. So you know, what are the, the musical decisions that led to the music? And um, this is what I, I really wanted to discover. Um, in improvisation. I mean, I was aware of people who improvise, particularly organists, where the practice still continues, um, but it wasn't clear to me, um, well, okay, of course we can all try and be a virtuosic improviser, but that's not really, that was like a, in a way, a modern construct. It's like the, the virtuoso improviser that does this extraordinary skill. No, I wanted, in a way, to use improvisation as a way of getting beneath the surface of the music. Um, and this is what I want to talk about today. So it's really, in a cognitive way, it's as much about mental representation. <clears throat> How do we um, imagine and construct the, the score in our heads? What does it mean to us? So if we just get the... I'm going to need somebody on the controls because I'm going to go here. It's the screen saver. If we could get the, the PDF of the bar back up. <clears throat> so this is... Um, um, yeah, here we go. This is the piece that's uh, based on the chorale theme, which is very common, common practice. And I'll give you a quick tour through the, through the piece. We get rid of the Netflix. I don't need that. Oh. <laughs> I got it is written for, for organ, and ideally I, I would um, illustrate this, this as much on the organ as it goes on the harpsichord. It's really clearly not, not a harpsichord chorale part either, um, but it doesn't matter. In a way, we could say, okay, it's the, the registrations of the organ, which are extremely colourful, um, they're also another layer of, of knowledge and practice. It can be kind of also quite distracting. Um, so we're going to talk really about nuts and bolts today. But, So, quick tools of the piece. What you have is for Bach quite a simple harmonization. <laughs> uh, they do get more simple than this. <clears throat> um, I could just as easily just play the theme. 
which is through the piece, um, what he does is um, give it a kind of an extraordinary amount of treatment. So the, the theme, which you could say, is almost, you know, like these chorales, they're, they're like folk songs, you know, they're, they're, they're congregational material. If we could go down and uh, look through the, through, the, through the pages. So going down, you see, um, now we have a duet, there's two voices, extended figurations of the left hand, and then an ornamented... <laughs> Loosely around the theme, but it's uh, you could almost say it's two two variations in one actually. It's it's because you had this. Uh <laughs> So it's, um, you can say all, all this in, in psychological terms is to, um, is to communicate and inspire people to, to get involved with the, with the theme. Now what we happens is the, the theme goes into the bass um, for this uh, nice dramatic one in, in three parts. It's only three, but it sounds like more in, in terms of... <laughs> so with lots 
lots of um, uh, suspensions that go on, and the yeah the theme is, is in the bass, so he has to harmonise it from it, in a way, turns it on its head, so harmonising from above. Um, let's go down. <coughs> Now, this is also in triple time, but in kind of uh, more extended. So instead of triplets, we now have sextuplets in the, the decoration. And the theme is back on the top, and it's very clever because the, the sextuplets are kind of handed between the hands. Um, so. <laughs> Um, so let's keep going. <coughs> um, this one is a, the theme is in the the, the pedals. It's in the bass. We're back in uh, we're still in triple time. We're in a very different kind of triple time, where you've got a kind of two part invention in the, the hands, or you know, there's a very strong imitation or little canonic figures um, going around the theme and the bass. Um, yep, let's carry on. <coughs> Oh, no, this is one of my favorite ones. One of, it's what I call the big finale. It's where you have a kind of um, introduction, um, organo plano, full organ, nice walking tempo. Um, you've already got one, two, three, four parts going, and then the chorale comes in in a big cantus firmus. Um, and between the phrases of the theme, you also have this, um, this, this kind of writ uh, concerto con continues. <coughs> in the in the tutti, um, it's a fabulous effect. Let's just carry on to the end. The the final variation is basically just bringing it to a close. It's a rich harmonisation um, in yeah yeah five parts. So the with. Um, <laughs> slowly enough and there's enough moving parts. So <clears throat> that's the, the piece that, um, that I've taken as the, the model today. Um, and what does it mean? I mean, as, a, as an interpretive musician, how can one possibly start to, to make one's own music based on a model? Um, <clears throat> when I started this study, it was what I wanted to do was to first of all, teach myself how to improvise, but I also sensed a gap in literature. There was all these manuals on kind of how you can improvise, you know, you just do these exercises. At the same time, nobody that I knew improvised, at least not in a classical thing. It hadn't really happened at the institutions I'd been at. Even though I was a student with Gabriella Montaigne, she didn't do any improvising in the Royal Academy of Music. She just left it outside. That was clearly not the place to be doing it. And there was not really much knowledge about how people, um, Actually, actually improvised. I mean, a lot of the, the psychological literature that I was interested in speculated about how experts um, might improvise, but a lot of this was kind of written in computer language. It was talking about how they overcame barriers of attention or um, it was about information processing at speed and this kind of stuff. Not stuff that really helps you to, to, to improvise. Um, and so what I wanted to do was write a, or in a way, find out what was the hidden knowledge. If I started myself learning to improvise, however long it would take, you get three years to do a doctorate, but it took me six in the end. Um, and uh, what would that, that process be? But what I came up against straight away was kind of emotional and cognitive barriers, because I just wasn't my understanding of music didn't allow me to improvise. What I'd understood through learning to play the piano and learning to play the organ was that you had to play every note in the score. Every note was fixed and it was all there for a reason. If you changed a note that Bach wrote, you, first of all, it was a bad thing to do. But why was it bad? Because you were changing the meaning of the piece. That by playing all the notes in their order, and this, this careful arrangement that the genius had, had created, 
you, the listeners, would understand some hidden, um, I guess, transcendental, eternal message that was, was written into the piece. And, uh, and so if I started changing or messing around with that, that was going to mess around with the message and that, that would be um, catastrophic. Uh, I found a very good account of all this in Lydia Gurr's uh, The Imaginary Museum of Musical Works, which uh, I drew on a lot for my PhD. But in fact, this is now kind of quite a well-trodden path in research, as people are saying, you know, these, these ideas about the text, that every note has to be in the place, that meanings are encoded into, into written works. Um, Daniel Leach Wilkinson has also, you know, raged about this in his publications as well. Unfortunately, it's still not really reaching the practice side of things, but you know we're all trying to time to correct that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I came up against the kind of the culture of my own learning with quite a bump, um, but still I had to find a way um, through these through these barriers. And of course, in the end, the only way is just to try. Uh, that you learn through through actions and through moving and trial and error. And I think also the discipline of the, the autoethnographic study. So I had to take journals, I had to record myself, and through recording I found quite a different account of my my experience than I had when I was actually improvising. Because as soon as I started improvising, it all sounded awful and I felt like a hooligan. And um, or at least you know, I was just wrecking everything and I didn't want anyone to hear me and and all that kind of stuff. But when I wrote about it, I was, I was reporting on progress and um, clear goals and much more constructive feedback. So that's something I also encourage my students to do, is to take journals, stand outside yourself, get a different perspective on your work. Now, um, we, could, we could go on to the chorale themes. What I want to try and communicate to you today is that a different perspective of musical text and structure is um, based on concepts. And this is kind of when you, when you start to sense the way that music is organised over time, um, kind of underlying functions. Now, when I started, I didn't, I would take a model as this, but I didn't really know how to get near it. So I spent a lot of time kind of trying to improvise what I would call just generic prelude material. So I'd sort of, I, I had some ideas from, you know, Bach, um, 48 Predators and Fugues, and I was sort of <laughs> And <clears throat> it was kind of frustrating for, because this took a long time doing this kind of stuff. And however I tried to do a new piece, I sort of... <laughs> But, um, uh, but I realise now looking back, actually, this is a very important part of learning because what I was doing was absorbing physically and creating um, <coughs> these, these important relationships, these voice leading patterns, which underlie all this kind of keyboard material, um, and which I later learned to, to bring towards my more stylistic forms. Um, <coughs> You know, one of the things that, that's very important with improvising is not to have too much theory, to think too much about it. And, but at the same time, you need to be quite sure of yourself, you need to be quite certain about things, otherwise you're always checking. And that wastes time and focus. Um, so either you just don't care, which is one way, but that doesn't really work when you're doing historical repertoire because it just sounds a mess. So you have to find principles that are going to turn off the questioning and make you a little bit more certain about what, what you're doing. Um, and I found these principles actually in Josef Fuchs's um, his principles of his descriptions of intervals and their motions, which is in the introduction to the species counterpoint. Um, and there he, he, he clearly distinguishes between um, strong consonant intervals, which are octave and a fifth. And then you have uh, imperfect consonances, which are the thirds and the sixths. And they're not so strong, so most of the motion is in thirds and sixths. And if you think about it, I mean, all of those repertoires. Whereas the, the octaves and the, the 
fifth, so used uh, more to kind of uh, meeting points of, of, of lines and things. Um, and in a way, more importantly, he talks about motions, that you have a parallel motion of intervals. <laughs> motion um, and you have oblique motions here. Yeah. So coming in from this east. And this is very good because they're, they're very nice images that you can use to construct and understand your own voice leading textures. So for example, the first task would be to, to harmonize a to start with the harmonization of the theme. And uh, we, we need to choose um, uh, a theme. If you can just scroll lightly through. And if these are themes that I mean, I try to choose ones that I don't know so well, so that I can honestly show you how one gets into a theme. This is not a prepared one that I would do for a concert. Okay? Now, if you see what you'd like me to do, then, then yell out and I'll do this one, I'll ask you for not. Yes, not so well known, ask you for not, which is quite good. Okay, so we have this one in G major. You sure you want them? <laughs> We'd like to choose another one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if we use, this, uh, use Fuchs's principles, we can construct a nice bass line um, using his uh, consonances. Sometimes the, it doesn't, and also there are, there are also lots of choices, like in the first phrase. You can start to hint towards D major. You could have that, for example, instead. Sometimes with these themes, there's a lot of uncertainty about what you're doing. Um, and I've also chosen quite a simple way to harmonize, which is within four parts, I put three voices in the right and one in the left, which means I can focus more on my bass line. If I was going to harmonize two in two, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. <laughs> Risk of parallel octaves. And so, what I want to say is that while one's um, improvising, there's already a, a desire to simplify a bit because the harmonization, even when you're trying to keep the harmonization simple, I'm thinking of the situation where you're almost actually improvising. So you're actually in church doing these variations because this is where all the music comes from. This is the point I want to make. The, the music comes from a practice of improvisation. I, I read a, an article recently that was talking about Books to Huda, who was a big hero of ours, that it's impossible for some of his works to be actually played on the organ he played on. And this, <clears throat> this shows in a way that the, the written text, it comes after the event is that it was very natural for these guys to just improvise the chorale variations in, in situ. But then if it came well, it came out well, or they wanted to make a model or that the, the chorale itself was important, they could do a written version afterwards. 
And the written version would kind of give you a chance to, to reflect on something, gives you a chance to kind of dot the, the I's and cross the T's and get everything in line. But it doesn't change the fact that it's come from a from an improvisational practice. So we've got our harmonization of the theme. But we want to, we're still kind of finding out uh, a bit of gremlins that we have to be today. Um, we're still in a way finding out what the harmony of the, the of the chorale can be. So it's very natural, I think, for the next variation to be a simplification, um, which means going into two parts and trying to see more clearly these, these underlying relationships of consonants and dissonance. So. to embellish a bit. It's just, you just do it. I mean, because... Um, I don't want to just hang around on that melody note. Yeah. Now, in a written version of Or If I Had the Experience of Bach and um, wanted to... Three minutes left. Um, and I wanted to, uh, you know, really expand the form, I could make an introduction. And there we have already a, the, the first variation. Now, if I, time is running short, I'll tell you that it's possible to go through all these in the same way and find underlying concepts or the keys to making similar kinds of variations. But we can <clears throat> bring even something as rich as the, the Zyker Blueset piece down to a few principles, which is um, we, we have up to four parts in the texture. Um, <clears throat> that's, and the melody line can be in any of those parts. It can be the soprano, alto, tenor, or bass. We have duplo or triple time, which means in this one was, was duplo. We can also change that to make it into triple time, quite easy. Yeah, and that also can be... Um, and so on and so forth. And also, that's the second principle. The third principle is that um, Bach was drawing on a repertoire of things that people did, um, characteristic rhythms and ways of constructing which you can you can just do that. Uh, so for my PhD recital, I was given a theme um, by the external examiner, which is John Brink in this case, and then I quickly notated ten variations of things that I could do because I, I, I knew by then quite a lot of variations. So with that theme. It would work to make a da dee da 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 dee 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 da dee
Yeah, I mean, I have met uh, cantors in Germany that have said, you know, a good improvisation should reflect the verses of the text. And so if there's a, uh, a penitential verse or text, it should, in a way, reflect that. And if there is, for example, in the text some uh, idea that happiness could be found, it would be a perfect example to do that. And I'm sure Bach did if he knew the texts you know, so, so well. Um, but I also think that in the this also was mentioned the idea of rhetoric today. Um, and I also think that Bach's music would certainly have reflected the, 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 the speeches that, the, 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 that were given in church, you know, the sermons and the, the texts and the, the gospels and whatever was going on. Another question. The, when, when those very early Arnstadter uh, Gemeindegesang uh, Begleiting to the, the to accompany the, the congregation, which was maybe not accompanied at all at that time. Yeah. But when you see that harmony where he goes, and he goes crazy wild. Yeah, and I wonder how popular that was. I mean, I think that the people used to complain quite a lot. I think, yeah, it's like his chromatic harmonies. But I think that the the we often misunderstand Bach's harmony. That we think it's he's only wrote complicated harmony. And I think that there was a lot, maybe the ones that he wrote down were more complicated than the ones that he played. Um, and I think there's, there are also researchers who are making quite a distinction between in the way the keyboard harmony and the vocal harmonizations. So the harmony may, may even be done like I did at the beginning with three voices in one and a bass line just to make a very simple start to, to the, the variations, you know. Uh, no, I can agree, but I mean, if you if you play those uh, this coming for the congregation, yes, you almost think no congregation could enter. Yeah, no, it's a <laughs> 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 it's <laughs> more <laughs> fantasy congregation. <laughs> so maybe they were just listening yeah. to it, that to remember the memory yeah. or something like that. Yes, and he was the most creative guy. Yeah, I, think, well, I don't think he was that popular. <laughs> Collective. Yeah. Yes. Uh, both really interesting uh, talks and, and, and presentations. Uh, I'm sort of by the, the shared question of the role of memory in both, mm -hmm. um, and in particular about the um, way that memory trunks information, right? Mm -hmm. The way that you have units of information that improvisatory practices or memorization practices gesture towards. And I'm wondering sort of what that tells us about how performers um, sort of stood in relationship to the materials that they that, that they then present, right? So in the last example that you gave us, sort of taking a phrase and then building a set of improvisations around it and then moving on to the next phrase. And so there's a unit that you're working with yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and then similarly in, in yours, the question of uh, what got me thinking about this, and I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear you talk about what's going on in your head as you're performing, right? Um, in the memory palace. Um, so for example, when you reach a moment in the, um, in the piece that you were playing um, where there's an imitative uh, gesture that's shared between parts, um, are you in the same room in the memory palace? Are you looking at the same image in the room in the memory palace when that imitative pattern is happening? Um, how does, for example, if you have an inversion of that pattern, are you reading that image in reverse? Um, so there's an interesting question of how information gets split up into smaller pieces and how that fits into the, the moment of the performance. Um, so I'm just curious to hear you talk a little bit just how your mind is working, how your memory is working um, as you're engaging with these materials. Okay, so when I, that was not the first piece that I wore down from Puppet from Partitura. So the first thing that I learned last summer was a mushroom piece. Um, and after 
at the time, it was only possible for me to read play from that notation if I basically memorized the whole thing or the whole passage. And it was Bergamasca, uh, so it was much shorter. And I it was successful, but only to some extent. People say, "Oh, you are you have this pianist training. You play from heart, blah blah blah." So it worked well, but it doesn't work so well because in trying to just remember everything, I sort of compressed a lot of information. Um, the sort of um, the, the symmetries or the shapes, because I wanted to be I wanted it to be just flowing out from my heart or whatever. And then after I started reading about uh, this theory about artificial memory, because I don't think I made it really clear today because Cecil talked about was better memorized in small chunks. And for me, uh, the image that you're talking about, I no, I don't think of you know a, a four bar or a two bar pattern as an image. That's uh, image for me is um, the way that I use it is on the scale of a. A, a passage or a location, they say, and then these the the the, the symmetries. That's just ordering, ordering of things, and then so I became uh, for me as this score helps me because it shows the the ordering and the shapes of different voices, mm -hmm. and then that helps me to remember. They according to the theory, it's these written down or printed things are supposed to help us remember what has been created. So in this sense, um, this notation helped me to, to remember what I learned and what festival you wrote in that case. <clears throat> yeah, I think memory is very much a question of um, queuing. It's like, yes. what, what do you queue? find a way of getting it to happen. I mean, of course, uh, this is why I tend to stick to the repertoire. If I found a 19th century here, it probably would work. Because uh, the, the, the melodies just don't, don't I don't know, the, the, the line of the melody and the way they are in the mode and the, and the harmony just doesn't fit. They're, they're too already 
too or they're too chromatic. But how does that? Um, what I didn't quite understand. Did, your did you, for, for in your case, do you stock all the in your memory when you're playing the facts about Fantasia, all the different ways in which this descending or ascending all scale the pattern ways. can be superimposed? Do you try it or all of them? No, I haven't. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't tried. But this would make a difference, I think, between what's written or all this conceptual idea, which is what I was trying to, I think, what I was trying to communicate with the idea that the concept, the concept then becomes imitation, imitation of the third or the fourth or the fifth, which is quite a different, is something, a principle you can generalize on, <coughs> which is quite different from the execution of something that's written or the memory of something that, that's determined. Well, the question is, for instance, with partitura, how far away this is from the cartella? The 16th century Cartella, which of course is famously also the title of Banchieri's Treatise, but which is a slate on which, to which you compose in a kind of open square format, and which you then go on to transcribe in separate parts. So these, these, uh, these partitura, in a sense, they look like what a composer would have used. Yeah. So my, 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 my question there is also because one of the treatises you were citing here. I forgot which one says that it's very useful when you when you want to learn to compose. And I think that's exactly what you are if you pursue this, you will start off composing because you will you will have learned what goes with what. That's a I mean it's certainly I, I, I after my PhD was I, I realized I could write down what I'd done. I mean I have my notes for each variation. And then I thought, okay, I could write, this could become uh, a chorale partita, in which case I'd kind of, what we call reverse, what you said, reverse engineered the whole process of, of what I started with, because I started with models like Psychoclusive, and then I kind of learned how to make the patterns myself, and then I was given the task to, to make an improvisation on another chorale theme. I jotted down a thing which literally took me 15, 20 minutes, because I, and I wasn't even doing it to a stopwatch, I just thought, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And then I realised I had a piece, and that was the way. And then the way that I'd answered at least that question: How would he come to this this form? Did he come to it? He could have come to it that way. And and this was this was very satisfying because always there's this danger that we reconstruct the past in, in, in from what we know because of the way the music is written now, or what the value that we give into composition processes and things that we give now. We think, oh automatically the Bach must have done it in the same way, and it, it just wasn't. It was a very different kind of practice. Yes? Yeah, I mean, your comment makes me really think about the difference between objects and practices, yeah. right? That, like, what you're talking about is that we're not fetishizing the object. Yeah. We're relearning practices, and the practices end up changing our relationship to the object, yeah. um, and helping us rethink about what the object is aiming to, to produce, or yeah. what it invites us into. Yeah. Um, and with regards to practices, I was really curious to ask whether, you know, when you're engaged in the act of improvisation, um, you have these kinds of gestures and these kinds of techniques in uh, uh, Canada at the fourth, Canada at the fifth. Mm. Um, to what extent is that a, a, a thinking process, and to what extent is that an enacting process for you? By which I, by which I mean, you know, to what extent is your, your, are your fingers on autopilot? Um, you know, they sort of know where they're supposed to go, they know what kinds of movements and gestures mm -hmm. are, are sort of uh, just through habit you've sort of acquired, um, you know, this hand is going to respond to this hand, or this yeah. melodic turn is going to respond to this melodic turn. You know, to what extent is it knowledge that's sitting inside your body, mm -hmm. and to what extent is it knowledge that's running up here? Um, or is there a relation between those two? Um, can you talk well, about that? That, that's why I, I chose this repertoire, actually, because it, this kind of style, because I think, of course, it's 50% one, 50% the other, right. and the, the lines are always shifting and changing between the, the piece, the improviser, the style, and that. But clearly, in my, in my view, there are ways of improvising which are almost automatic. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, I mean, I had a, a colleague who said, oh, you know, if you want to improvise in the style of Scriabin, mean, you make this scale. And actually, once you've got, um, used to that, once you've absorbed that scale and you've got used to the kind of rhetoric of, of late scrum, it's possible to churn the stuff out as long as you want. And you don't have to think very hard. And the you can also, you know, make in modern styles and, and modal modal ways, 
big yeah. organ symphonies if you want. It's not mentally very taxing because the, 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 the relationships of dissonance and consonants are very, are very tolerant, they're very wide. So you can really think quite freely, oh, I'm going to bring in some, you know, some gestures here, I'm going to make a big tutti here. You don't have to kind of work it out. Um, whereas this, this style, you, you really do, it has to be organized, and it's a lot of mental training, and you can never really just go with the fingers. You, there's always an element of, of kind of, okay, I can do this, I can do that. Um, but that, that was a challenge, I mean, that, that's why I wanted to do it. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. Jonathan. Thanks. I was just wondering, thanks both for your presentations. Uh, I was just wondering, in the light of uh, I can do this, I can do that, and what's allowed and what's not allowed, and how Bach might have scandalized uh, people walking into church with harmonizations, mm -hmm. and the, the, the topic of, of the alien, of introducing the alien uh, arose this morning mm -hmm. in terms of the pathos formality. I guess, notions like this. <clears throat> and I, I think one sees this phenomenon also in, in the way, for instance, uh, jazz is conventionally taught now very successfully in mm -hmm. some respects. Introducing the alien is the most difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the, as it were, authentic alien. Of course, it's, difficult, it's easy to do something random. Yeah. But to do something, to do something meaningfully alien yeah. is actually very tricky. Yeah, well, the thing is with this, this improvising on models, I mean, I had a lot of discussion with this with students in Germany, actually, who were, they, they have to learn on these models, and some of them were very unhappy about it, because it's, um, it's like, the, it's such hard work, and then at the end you have something which, does, which doesn't, you know, very often, um, the closer you get to bark, the, the less meaning it seems to have, because you're just making stuff which is completely stylistically done, you know. Yeah, I mean, personally, I don't feel this, but for other reasons, it's, it's in the concert for me. It's nice to improvise because it makes a different relationship with the audience, whatever I do. Um, <clears throat> but of course, it gets to the point which I, I feel now in my work where I want to kind of bring the whole thing into the twenty first century, you know, um, and say, okay, now I want to come out in the style a little bit or introduce things in there which a little bit come from me and that are not so cautious, um, not so in the style. Well, they're, they're a little bit more chromatic, and so I think actually Bach wouldn't have done that, but it's okay. It's still part of this part of this thing. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have done that, but you know, um, that's where we are now. But I mean, there's still, um, I, I can't completely, you know, the idea of this is not to completely retread Bach's life, um, or, or another composer, you know, I'm, I'm just as interested in books to Huda anyway. So. But the, the, yeah, there is a limit to how much you want, to, how much, how close you want to go to the start. Well, if I can improvise a little synthesis or summary, because it really struck me. I think it's fascinating that we saw a beautiful incident of two sides of the same coin, because it's keyboard music. Uh, keyboardists have to sometimes look at their fingers, and you could see that Alice uh, had to move her eyes away from the score to execute a jump or, you know, intricate movements like crossing fingers. Mm -hmm. um, she had to rely on memory uh, or at least um, sight read enough in advance to be able to get that kind of chunk in the head uh, to well, make do until you have to look again. Actually, I can play this piece from memory backwards. <laughs> just just uh, uh, perfection, not, not actually retrograde, but, but, but that, that but, is the thing that <laughs> you have to rely much more on memory than many other instruments where you don't need, you can only look at the score. And I saw that something from the other side with uh, Jonathan. You played constantly looking only there and when there were mistakes, you mm. muffled them into the, the, to the improvised uh, section. So I think that's a, an interesting um, double view on, on what it's like to, you know, is this memorization or is it improvisation? Because when you sight read, you do both at the same time. It's an intricate mm -hmm. uh, combination. Well, thank you both thank you. very much. <laughs> and I invite the floor to the next. Oh no, it's it's an intermission. <laughs> <laughs>